In collaboration with BrainMind, we will now talk about Alzheimer's diagnosis and standard treatments. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of neurodegenerative dementia. Now, we use the term dementia, which is an umbrella term that can include several different types of problems or pathologies. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, but there are other types too. Vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, among many others. However, by far, at least 60, 70, maybe even 75% of the time, Alzheimer's disease will be the diagnosis in a person that has progressive cognitive decline, most specifically progressive short-term memory loss that also includes changes in behavior and even changes in sleep. So how do we make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? Well, we talk to the patient. If you know someone that has cognitive changes, maybe try to learn about what those cognitive changes specifically are. And progressive short-term memory loss that gets worse over time, over months or years, especially in a person that has a family member with Alzheimer's disease, common things happen commonly. Even without an MRI, without blood tests, without an extensive diagnostic workup, making a diagnosis based on the history, the clinical history, the questions that you can ask someone with a cognitive impairment, you can make a diagnosis pretty reasonably well, probably 80% of the time, just by clinical history alone. But we now have made tremendous scientific advances. We can now use very specific diagnostic tools to make an accurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So how do we do this? When a person wants to understand what their likelihood of Alzheimer's disease is, they number one have to see a physician. You can see a primary care doctor, but most commonly physicians that specialize in neurology, psychiatry, or geriatric psychiatry are the physicians that are most in tune and the most subspecialized in terms of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. There are even Alzheimer's disease and cognitive neurology specialists that you can get a second opinion from or even a first opinion. So when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, the number one aspect of diagnosis is to take a very detailed history. When did the symptoms start? Is there a family member with the disease? Explain the symptoms very specifically. And then once we do that, we go on to specific testing. So first, we want to do blood tests. Blood tests are important because we need to rule out something else. People with vitamin deficiencies, such as B12, someone may have a thyroid problem that may mimic a cognitive decline due to dementia. So we do a variety of blood tests, and maybe about five, maybe seven to eight percent of the time, we find something in the blood that could be mimicking a dementia. Then we do a brain imaging test. Now, brain imaging can comprise several different types, a CAT scan, which is easy and quick, but not as precise and accurate, or an MRI of the brain is mostly what most physicians do to do an evaluation initially. An MRI of the brain can look at the size of different parts of the brain, specifically the memory center in the brain called the hippocampus. If there is shrinkage or atrophy of the memory center in the brain in a person with progressive short-term memory loss and other behavioral or sleep changes, then again, common things happen commonly. That person most likely has Alzheimer's disease. But can we be even more specific? Well, yes, we now have several ways to image the brain in a more precise way. There are several FDA approved imaging agents that can actually label whether or not someone has amyloid in the brain. Amyloid is the pathologic protein that builds up in the brain over time, over decades in a person with Alzheimer's disease. So now we can detect amyloid in the brain by using a very specific test called a PET scan or positron emission tomography. The issue with PET scans is that we just can't use them typically in clinical practice because they're often actually almost essentially always not covered by medical insurance. And they cost several thousand dollars, three to four to five to six thousand dollars in some areas. So if someone is willing to pay the money or can get that study in a, in a research trial, then we can order an amyloid scan to more definitively prove whether or not a person has Alzheimer's disease as the cause of their cognitive changes. There are even now tau scans. Tau is another pathology. It's another part of the Alzheimer's disease picture where it's a problem that builds up in the brain and something called neurofibrillary tangles. Well, now we even have imaging agents that can look at tau in the brain. Further, we can look at glucose metabolism in the brain. 
That's called a PET scan, like we talked about earlier, but something called an FDG PET scan, where it looks at glucose hypometabolism, meaning reduced metabolic activity, in certain parts of the brain that are responsible for cognitive function related to Alzheimer's disease dementia. So regardless of what brain imaging study you choose, you can get a more precise picture on if that person has dementia due to Alzheimer's or due to another cause. Finally, when someone passes away at an autopsy, that is the way to make a definitive diagnosis by looking at the brain under a microscope. But today, we don't have to wait till that time. We can do tests before then. In addition to brain imaging tests, we can do spinal fluid tests. Well, that means a lumbar puncture or someone gets a spinal tap, simple enough procedure that can be done in an outpatient office setting. And we can look in the brain, the fluid, and understand if there are tau and amyloid levels that are consistent with Alzheimer's disease. Other ways that we can help make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's include detailed neuropsychological testing or detailed cognitive testing that look at different brain function. So for example, memory, long-term versus short-term, learning abilities, higher order processing, processing speed and attention. So when we take all of these diagnostic activities together, we can truly better understand what the precise diagnosis is. When it comes to early diagnosis, Alzheimer's disease starts in the brain decades, decades before the first clinical symptom. If we can do early detection, that's when we can make the most strides in terms of prevention as well as early treatment. So we can even use some of these tests very early, even before symptoms start. So the advances that we've made in science really help to clarify which type of dementia a person can have or if a person is not actually having dementia at all. When it comes to Alzheimer's disease, what are the treatments? When someone truly has Alzheimer's disease dementia, there are currently only a handful of FDA-approved drugs. Two categories include cholinesterase inhibitors, which include denepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. In addition, there's another mechanism, an NMDA antagonist medication called memantine. So for mild, moderate, and severe Alzheimer's disease dementia, you can use a cholinesterase inhibitor and when someone progresses to moderate to severe, you can add in memantine for combination therapy. Now, while there are only a handful of FDA-approved drugs at this time, there are a variety of other interventions that are either on the horizon or things that we can do today to help from pharmacologic approaches like vitamins and supplements to also non-pharmacologic approaches, whether it's exercise or dietary changes or sleep hygiene or behavioral modifications, cognitive training, music therapy, the list goes on and on. So when it comes to Alzheimer's disease as a discrete diagnosis, and you're trying to determine whether a person does or does not have dementia, there are a variety of studies that we can do today. So in summary, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, but not all dementias are Alzheimer's disease.